I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. Father God, we praise you this morning. God, we glorify you for you alone are the one who sits on the throne. God, forgive us for where we have tried to replace you, where we have put people and things in your place. God, this morning we glorify you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need remind how I've been set free? 
There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh, my dad left for dead beneath the water. no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. The be Should I ever need reminding when power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody. Now that power lives in me, there is another in the fire. song that we will never be alone whether the waters rage against us whether we stand in the fire whatever life throws at us and whatever the enemy throws at us we will have one standing there with us it's a glorious truth and it's only true it's only true because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ we're gonna transition to a time of communion here we have these cups if you didn't grab one of these go ahead they're right in the back just go ahead and get up and go and grab one of those if you're a believer here with us today uh, and you didn't get one of these. And I would just encourage you, as I always do, to just sort of pre-peel that thing a little bit because it can be hard in the moment. I've almost spilled juice all over the stage, and I would have heard about that and stuff. So just get that thing pre-peeled. But as we come together, this is a heavy moment in our life as a church, not because it accomplishes God's favor on our behalf, but because we remember the most significant thing in all of eternity and in all of life that Jesus laid himself down on our behalf. And if you keep that at the forefront of your mind throughout your day, throughout your week, then you're going to walk in a direction that prepares you uh, for all of eternity with the Lord. And so uh, before we receive this, 
I want to take a minute, and we'll allow Rita to play on the piano here. Just take a minute to search your heart. And if you have sins that you have not confessed to the Lord, if you have things that you have against a brother or sister, settle those now so that we can rejoice and proclaim the death of Christ together as one. First Corinthians 11, as Paul explains communion to us, he says, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks for that bread, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new, the new relationship that I will have with you in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and whenever we drink this cup together in unity, we proclaim the Lord Jesus' death until he comes. And so, if you would repeat with me, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand once again as we continue in worship? within your name this we know this we know you promise never to forsake if you begin you will sustain this we know this we know call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every and the earth announce the fullness of your word this we know this we know and every enemy will flee as we declare your victory this we know this we know, I will call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Strong. 
is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to Shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's great to be here with you guys, and we reached the end. We're at Matthew 28 today, so if you're following along in your copy of God's Word, that's where you can go. Uh, but before we dive into the text, I got a couple of things I want to bring up. Uh, a couple of, I think, really exciting things that are going on here uh, that I want you to be aware of. First of all, uh, you saw a video uh, the week that I was on vacation of me and my daughter, and we said, coming in September, look for news about small groups, right? And so I'm here to tell you again, coming next week. <laughs> next week, we're going to have all of the information that your heart can desire as far as what these new small groups, these sermon-based small groups are going to be about and why we believe that they should be a core element of being a part of this church. And so, um, and as well, signups will start next week for those. Uh, we will have signups in the foyer as well as in the app on the website, all of those places you'll be able to find these community groups, these groups where we're going to be getting into God's Word together kind of around the text that we go through on Sunday, okay? And so that will be, that will be coming. But also, I wanted to tell you uh, that there's going to be a membership class. There will be a two-week membership class on Sunday, October 10th and October 17th. And if you just wish to know more about Cascades and what it means to be a member here, or if you're ready to take that step and become a member here, which means uh, you can vote, which means that you're committed to this body to use the gifts that God has given you uh, to bless and benefit and help grow other people here at Cascades, as well as reaching out to those who do not yet know Jesus, right? Uh, and so becoming a member is, uh, is an awesome thing. It's a level of kind of upping your commitment here um, and so if you want to know more about that, by going to the class, you are not blood oathing that you're going to follow through or become a member, uh, but it's just an opportunity for you to know more about who we are and why we do what we do. So you can sign up in the foyer. There's, there's a table out there that you can sign up for the membership class on October 10th and 17th. There will also be a baptism service on Sunday, October 24th. I already know of a few people who are planning on getting baptized. Praise the Lord for that. So you can sign up for that at the table or on the app, and we will probably also that week bring people into membership as well. And so those are all really exciting things going on here, uh, and I hope you're as excited about those as, as I am. Well, as we do dive into the text, I want to kind of bring us back to what we talked about last week. Last week, I floated an idea, I floated a, a hypothesis, that the meaning of life, of all existence itself, is for God to display His glory in, which is, you know, His justice, His wrath, His mercy, and His grace, just the fullness of who He is, and He does that most magnificently through the cross, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if all, if all the world was created and all of the universe was created to declare the glory of God, then this is the moment for which the world was created. And last week, last week we investigated that claim by looking at his justice and wrath as Jesus took on the sins of the world and God poured out divine wrath. Remember we talked about how Jesus suffered physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we just saw the brutal nature of the of the willing sacrifice that Jesus went through. And so last week we saw how glorious God is in his justice and in the amount of punishment that he can pour out. Um, and God could have, God could have uh, in the garden, God could have restrained Satan. Sovereign Lord, he, he, restrained, he could have restrained Satan and said, nope, you're not going to go and tempt Adam and Eve. 
and you're not going to tempt their children, and Cain's not going to kill Abel, and they're not going to have pain in childbirth, and they're going to be fruitful, and they're going to multiply and populate the earth, and then God could have restrained Satan until the moment that the earth is just full and populated with humans, and then he could have said, go nuts. And then Satan could have went around and tempting, and person after person fall, and God could have just displayed his awesome wrath against the whole world by just instantly just wiping it out and putting people through um, that eternal punishment that they deserve for becoming enemies of God. He could have done that. However, God in his sovereign wisdom devised a plan, remember before the creation of the world, devised a plan where he could reveal more fully who he is. That plan would have revealed his justice and his wrath. But it would have given no room to display his grace and his mercy and his love, all of which, justice, wrath, grace, mercy, love, all of which find their fullest definition in God himself. And that would not have been on display. And so Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world to redeem us, to buy us back, those who rebelled and became slaves to our sinful way. Jesus was chosen to become that rescue plan to shine light into it, into utter darkness and the mercy and grace of god is the reason for a cross instead of only plague only death only condemnation and so praise jesus for that remember we looked at this verse first peter 1 18 to 20 for you know that it was not with perishable things such as gold or silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life Notice that, the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world. The whole reason the world was created was so that Jesus could come and redeem it. And so last week, we, we kicked off with some pretty depressing quotes about the meaning of life from unbelievers. So this week, I want to start uh, with one which is, Sounds pretty similar to those, but is actually found in Scripture. Last week I said, if you want to see the hopelessness and despair of life without meaning or purpose from a human perspective, go to the book of Ecclesiastes. If you want to see it drive somebody crazy, go and read the book of Ecclesiastes. Now I'm going to read a portion of Ecclesiastes, and I just want to warn you here. Ecclesiastes functions really differently than most books in the Bible. Ecclesiastes, for a long portion of it, Solomon, its, its writer, uh, wisest king, right, um, if you know his, his backstory, spends a long portion of this book expressing the frustration of life from the perspective of a human without relation to, to the Lord. To understand the truth that comes from this book, you've got to get to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes and see that his final uh, piece of advice and his final kind of resolves it back to the only thing good under the sun is to fear the Lord, right? And so, uh, this section could be taken out of context and, and really misunderstood as God's truth. It's sharing from a human perspective here. But listen to this. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who, sac those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. I'm kind of picking a few verses here. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun, the same destiny overtakes all. What's that one destiny that we all have? Verse 5. For the living know that they will die, and the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. And just stop for a second. Solomon is one of the more prosperous kings of Israel. People are coming and paying homage to him. He builds the Lord's temple. And there's just a lot of prosperous and glorious things happening in Solomon's life. He's sort of the guy who has all the perspective. What's going to be my legacy? I don't get to experience this after I leave. My love, my wisdom away it all feels like vanity and so here's his conclusion in verse 7 here's what you should do then go eat your food with gladness drink your wine with a joyful heart for God has already approved what you do always be clothed in white always anoint your head with oil and enjoy life with your wife whom you love 
all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For the realm of the de- for in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. Ecclesiastes nine, select verses from two to ten. It sounds eerily sim- similar to me to the Woody Allen quote that we gave last week which was the artist's job is not to succumb to the despair, but to find an antidote for the emptiness of existence. Solomon says, no matter good or bad, all die. No one comes back, right, from the human perspective, from the worldly perspective. It's over. So the best you can do is to distract yourself with pleasures like food and goodness, uh, your wife, hard work, being a, a clean and good person. Not a terrible list of things, right? On the whole, you look at a person who enjoys those things, you're like, pretty moral person. Not not a slanderer, not a uh, person you would point out as this wicked sinner. However, the backdrop of this is it's all an attempt to antidote the emptiness of earthly existence. And if I can go back to 1 Peter 1 here, What was it that he said? Jesus came to redeem you from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And guys, we're so busy and life is so urgent and we live in a culture of urgency and busyness that that's what people are doing. They're distracting themselves from the ultimate question of what purpose does my life really serve? What do I actually leave behind? What good can I carry out? And people at their best are just distracting themselves. At their worst, they've come to the conclusion that it's all about me just enjoying as much as I possibly can in my little time here on earth. But in Matthew 28, the resurrection of Christ is an eternal dagger in the heart of hopelessness and despair. Amen? Let me say that again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an eternal dagger in the heart of hopelessness and despair. The grave, the grave is empty so that we don't have to be anymore. The grave is empty so that your life will never again be empty. And so this morning we're going to celebrate Easter Sunday all the way in September. Easter in September. If you can have Christmas in July, we're going to have Easter in September and it's way better, right? Uh, And so we're going to discover the mercy and grace and hope and freedom and peace and love of God all displayed in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Hope is dawning. The world is coming back, back from the brink. And so we look into Matthew 28, and we're going to look at it from the perspective of four different groups of people. I think that Matthew shows us four distinct groups of people. All of them react to the resurrection in a unique way. A couple of them react in a similar way, but still a little bit unique. And so we're going to go down through these four groups of people, uh, and that is on the screen there. The women the guards, the religious leaders, and the 11 disciples. Not the 12 disciples, because by this point, Judas, who betrayed Jesus, has hanged himself. Uh, And so now there's only the 11 until in Acts, they decide to uh, add a 12th again, right? And so we're going to look at these four people. Now, I didn't put this on the PowerPoint because I didn't plan on doing it. But as I kind of went back over things this morning, I really felt led to actually read the whole chapter here. Sometimes we just dive in, and I just assume that you guys have read the chapter leading up to it. This isn't me saying that you didn't, but I just think this is such a glorious moment in eternity. Let's rejoice together and hear God's actual words before you hear me uh, talk about what some of this means for us. And so Matthew 28, you can follow along in your own uh, copy of Scripture or uh, just listen. After the Sabbath, At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. 
He has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say to his disciples, um, his, or you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. In this report, sorry, <coughs> If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always and to the very end of the age. That's a glorious passage. If it's not for Matthew 28, we aren't here today. We don't matter If it's not for Matthew 28, we find the only purpose in our existence is to eventually be fully punished by Jesus and by God the Father and by the Holy Spirit to have the wrath of God poured out on us. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have hope and we have purpose and we have a mission. We have more than what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. We have more than just eat, drink, enjoy your wife, work hard, just distract yourself. But we have glorious purpose, and we're going to get to that glorious purpose at the end of this passage. And so we're going to look at each of these four groups of people. Hopefully you kind of paid attention to them as we read. And we're going to start with the women. All right, the group of women here, these are disciples of Jesus, his followers, and they love him deeply. Sometimes when we say the disciples of Jesus, you think of just the 12 people who were going to become the 11 people, and then eventually 12 that would become the apostles, right? Right? And they're the ones who are most frequently talked about. We're talking into a culture that, that men are, are always the, the leaders here, and these are the people that Jesus hand-selected. But there's this whole other group of people who are also following Jesus who rightly can be called disciples. They love Jesus. They, they follow him. You can see by the emotions of the women here that they are incredibly distraught. One of the two is Mary Magdalene, which uh, in another gospel we learn that Jesus had exercised seven demons out of. And so both the angel and Jesus greet them with this same phrase, do not be afraid. And I think that's awesome. They're going to the tomb, they're bitter with grief, and they see this awe-inspiring. It just says his clothes were white like the sun, right? Like he's just glowing in appearance. So much so that when the uh, Roman guards saw him, they just passed out, right? They just seized up and dropped. And so these women see the angel and they see Jesus and the first word after the resurrection is this, don't be afraid. Now we can dig more into that, but we dug into that at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. In fact, it was even before we started Matthew back in December. Uh, I believe it was one of the first weeks in December. You can go back and listen to that on our website or on our app, I believe. Uh, And we did this message because of Bethlehem. What's true because Jesus came? The four angelic proclamations all started with, don't be afraid. Because of Bethlehem, we don't have to fear. Because of the resurrection of Christ, all of those things that we used to fear in our humanity should just melt away. Do not be afraid. There is a new kind of fear, a fear of the Lord that we can, that we can take up. But the fear of men and the fear of circumstance, all of that we can put behind us. 
because these angel, this angel and Jesus say to us, do not be afraid. Now that I have died for you, there is nothing more to fear. Now look at the women's reaction here. So the women, after seeing the angel, they hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Now, I think that's a fascinating phrase there. I don't, I don't know that there's this huge spiritual implication there, but I think to myself, at the, at the heaviest moments in my life, but the best moments in my life, that's a really good description of what was going on inside of me. Afraid, but filled with joy, and just eagerly running forward. And suddenly they meet, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus speaks to them. They experience some amount of fear, this kind of new thing that's going on. Could it be real? What's going on? This angelic being, we've never seen anything like this in, in, our, in our life. Now there's speculation as to who the other Mary is here. Uh, it is likely not the mother of Jesus, but it could have been. Um, and if it was, then of course she would have had one experience with an angelic proclamation before. But look at the emotions and look at the reaction of what's happening here. They leave afraid yet filled with joy, running. And I, and I take that running as an eagerness. This needs to get back to the disciples. Something incredible has happened, and we have to act on it now. And I think it's fascinating because when we see the, the, the disciples, the men, um, it's not revealed in Matthew, but in another gospel we're going to see, they were much less eager at first, okay? They had a different experience, too, but they were much less eager right off of the bat. But Jesus, however, sees them, and seeing them says, I am the end of all your fear. And what they do is they fall down, which is a very humble position, right? You think of people when they worship other deities or other things, what's the kind of bow down? It, when a king wants people to, to serve him, he's like, kneel before me, bend, bend the knee, right? Uh, and so you, this idea of getting down, getting low, holding on to the feet. My youth group students know this about me. I hate my ankles being grabbed. It's like my biggest like pet peeve, fear. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I owe Benjamin Fannin a couple of ankle grabs because he, he uh, served really well in one of our ministries. And so, I told, so at some point he gets to. But that's what they do. They, they fall down to the ground and they grab onto Jesus' feet, which, which in that day and age, the feet are just this dirty, disgusting kind of, your feet have to be washed and, and they've got dust all over them from sandals and whatnot. But they just get as low as they can get and they just want to cling to Jesus doesn't matter what this looks like for me. It doesn't matter about my reputation. It doesn't matter any of those things. I just got to hold on to Jesus. And they just began worshiping him because they saw the man who was crucified. They saw him pulled off lifeless from the, from the cross. They saw his body pierced and blood and water flow out. Just clear evidence. This guy is dead. And here he is alive. And just all of their hopes and dreams coming to life at the same time and they can't help but worship, worship Jesus. And so this is how the women react to the resurrection. The next group that we see here are the guards. We see a couple of different instances of how they react here. I'm going to have to make sure that nobody, nobody gets in, right? So this is what they're doing in front of the tomb. And when the angel appears, they shake and fall and become like dead men. And, and all I want to say about that because that would be a terrifying thing, right? Because all they could have conceived of are Jewish disciples. And they already saw the Jewish disciples try and fight back. Remember Jesus in the garden when he's being arrested? Peter pulls out his sword, tries to strike one of the, one of the, the soldiers, and only hits his ear, right? They're like, we're not really worried about these guys who are going to kind of come and rob the grave. And then an earthquake happens, and then an angel appears, and it's something they've never seen before. This, this stone, whether the earthquake shook it back away kind of naturally, or the angel just gets down there and just rolls it away, they're just like, Hoo! right? And they just drop out of fear. That's not the reaction I want us to focus on. But in that moment, and having heard that this was a man who claimed to be the king of the Jews, but also the divine king of the Jews... The Lord, the Son of God. Remember the centurion at the end of chapter 27 says, surely this man was the Son of God. And they would have recognized that implication to be 
deity itself, because Caesar claimed to be the son of God, deity himself, right? So when they see this angelic being, and then Jesus is gone when they get up, when they finally come out of that stupor, Jesus is gone. Don't they have every possible evidence that they needed to recognize Jesus as the Lord? However, when they come back and they tell the religious leaders who were the ones paying them to, to watch guard, when they tell them what happened, the uh, religious leaders offer the guards a large sum of money. And they tell them to tell a lie, and the guards comply. And they also offer protection, just in case the governor hears that, hey, these guards didn't do their job. Guards, Roman guards, would be killed for letting a prisoner free. And I assume the same would happen if the grave was robbed that they were supposed to be guarding. So I imagine that conversation, or I imagine that when they come back and they talk to the religious leaders, just being shaken to their core, but probably also embarrassed and fearful for their life. They had their eyes not on the risen Christ, but they had their eyes on the concerns of the world. What's going to happen to me? This Jesus guy is gone. His disciples took him, right? That's, uh, this angel sort of showed up. But I'm going to die. I'm not going to get paid. I'm probably going to be killed. What happens to my family? Those are real concerns but they had their eyes so caught up on those concerns that they take the money and they spread the lie and they stay out of trouble and they go on their way. Next, the religious leaders. The religious leaders we see in the next couple of verses or the couple of verses before that, um, which we have up on the screen. While the women were on their way, some of the, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests Everything that had happened. And when the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan. The heart of the religious leaders when they hear, not the report that Jesus' body is gone, because the guards came back and told everything that had happened. We were there. We didn't fall asleep. There was an earthquake. The stone rolled away. And there was an angel. And we just passed out. They told him everything. And hearing this, the religious leaders bow down to Jesus. No. They recognize that he is the true, right king of the Jews, the eternal son of God. No. They devised a plan. We thought we dealt with this Jesus thing. We thought we put it away for good. What in the world? What are we going to do now? Their hearts were so darkened. Their hearts were so blinded to the miracle and fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, that instead they immediately start doing damage control. They held a kind of illegal trial at night, and then Pilate is, is coming before him saying, I don't see anything with this guy. And they thought Pilate would just go along with them because he doesn't want to stir the pot. And here this unrighteous guy is saying, why would I kill this totally innocent dude? And they stir up the crowd and begin to incite the crowd towards a mob. And so finally the pilot does what they ask, fearing the crowd. Again, now they go to damage control. Again, they go to, we fear the people and we need the people's opinion so that we can continue to maintain the power that we have. Their hearts were so darkened and so blinded that immediately they started asking themselves, how can I gain back my position? How can I gain back my value? How can I gain back my control? Instead of surrendering to the one person who for all of eternity could give them value and importance. Instead of worshiping the one person who has true control. There's an irony there and a tragedy there. And so we come to our last group of people, the disciples. The disciples are these 11 men who had who had been with Jesus for about three years now. They had given up a fishing business. They had given up tax collecting. They had given up uh, uh, Simon, his, his zealot, you know, kind of uh, group and lifestyle. And the little that we know about these guys, they left everything. Home, they brought around with them barley bread. And if you don't know much about barley bread, barley bread was like literally in Jewish tradition only considered good enough for animals. 
And like Jesus, when, when, they're, when they're breaking bread and when they bring the bread that they have and stuff, they bring barley bread. So they don't have great food. They don't have a comfortable home. They gave up everything, and they followed this guy. And it's so fascinating to see these same disciples. Look at the example of Peter. I know we pick on Peter a lot, but I can't help it. It's there, and we have to. So, so we pick on Peter, not because, but because he's an awesome example of who we are, right? Peter, when he's out running his fishing business, and Jesus teaches, and then he says, and they're exhausted from all night. You know, I think this is Luke 5, I believe. All night they've been fishing. They're exhausted. Professional fishermen, they know where and when to fish all night, no fish. They're back, they hear this guy preach this awesome message, and he says, hey, let's go back out fishing. And they're like, it's daytime, you're not going to catch anything. But they do it, because it's uh, an important teacher in their eyes. So they go out, and he says, hey, cast your nets on this side, and they just get the catch of a lifetime, right? Would have made them famous, would have made them rich, and they're hauling this thing in, and the first thing Peter does, in all of his humility, because Peter was incredibly humble at, bege- at the beginning there, he just says, you got to, teacher, you got to get away from me. I am not worthy. I'm a sinful man. Hear the humility there contrasted to last week in Matthew 27, where Peter leads the other apostles when Jesus says, all of you will fall away from me. Actually, I think this is chapter 26. All of you will fall away from me. And Peter says, no, even if I have to die, I will never leave you. He says, not only will you leave me, but you'll deny me too. Peter, this incredibly humble person at the beginning of this three-year journey with Jesus, has gotten to a spot where he is overestimating how spiritually strong and how spiritually uh, with it that he is. And one of the fascinating things about the crucifixion story for the disciples is it puts on full display. Almost every gospel writer just lays it out how embarrassing this situation was for the disciples. The cross of Jesus, the crucifixion story, it doesn't just gloriously exclaim how great God is. It also acutely points out how weak even the closest followers of Jesus were. And so these men are back in their home. Other other Things, other uh, gospels tell us that they were behind locked doors, concerned that those religious leaders were going to come for them next. Try, their whole worldview is spinning, everything they left behind, and now the Messiah is dead. And the women come back and they report to them, he's alive. And in another gospel, it tells us that they just didn't believe him. And I'll be honest with you, this is probably partially because women were just, their, their word was devalued in that day. And I don't think that's a good thing. That's not something that Jesus says, hey, don't value women's, women's opinion or, or their words. They're not how, how, like good witnesses. That's not, that's not from God, right? But that was just the culture in that day and age. In age. But, it, but it sparked enough of a curiosity in Peter that he runs to the tomb, sees the linens, and comes back again filled with, with joy. And so the disciples have discovered that Jesus is risen, and so they go and they obey, and they head out of Jerusalem, go back to Galilee, up onto the mountain where Jesus had... In the book of Matthew. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And I just, I don't want to spend much time, there's a lot of speculation as to what that word doubted there, what that means. Does that refer to Thomas in the interaction where he doubted and then he gets to he gets to feel Jesus' hand. Matthew is not giving us every interaction that Jesus had with the disciples. Matthew's way of saying, hey, there was some doubt there at one point, or this word for doubted is only used twice in the in the New Testament. uh, And the word has more of a hesitancy than a unbelief attached to it. It's like it's like when you, somebody tells you you're going to be safe when you walk across these hot coals, just walk steady and whatnot, and you kind of get there and you're like, ah. it's not that you don't believe the person, but you just kind of have that hesitancy before you go. The word kind of has that implication. But what is clear here is when they're seeing him from afar, when they're seeing him on the mountain, some just instantly worshiped and some doubted. But then Jesus came close to them, and here are his words to him, to them. All authority on heaven and on earth. And these are Jesus' words to you. Because these 11 disciples, one over disciples, 
who won over disciples, and disciple just means a follower of Jesus, all the way until somebody led you to Jesus, or if you're here and you don't know Jesus yet, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end of our message. But if you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, these words are directly to you as well. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. When we say go together in prayer, which is our theme kind of line for this year here at Cascades, the go comes from this verse. Go be on mission for Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples, make people followers of Jesus from all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And this is a beautiful thing that Jesus says at the end of the book of Matthew. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When the apostles come and see Jesus, excited, hopeful, they worship him like the women did. But the attitude that I want you to see, both in the women and the disciples, of course is worship, but also Jesus makes this clear statement about what they are to do. And if you know anything about the book of Acts, or if you know anything about uh, what we have from early church fathers telling us about what the apostles, these disciples did, They all obeyed this command until they died obeying this command. Each of them die obeying this command. And I think that's fascinating. Thinking about who the disciples were before the resurrection, overestimating how faithful they're going to be, and then Jesus is arrested. They're not even arrested. And they're like, let's get out of here. It even says one of them, like cloak got stepped on or something and just runs naked away like I don't I'm not even gonna clothe myself again I gotta get out of here right they all abandon Jesus Peter as a representative of all of them denies Jesus then all of them had made these crazy statements like of course we're gonna die with you Jesus if you have to die we'll die they overestimated after the resurrection these same men who overestimated themselves go to Acts 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 And look at the way they interact with the Jewish leaders, who they were locking their doors terrified of. And then they see Jesus alive. They unlock the door. They go out in the streets. God gives them the power to do miracles, which is awesome, right? They heal a guy. The religious leaders are like, what is going on? They bring him in. They threaten them. They go back and rejoice and pray. Not that the threat won't come true, but that we will have the ability to withstand when persecution comes. They go out and preach again. They're brought in. They're flogged. They anoint certain people to be deacons in their church. One of them is Stephen. Stephen goes out and preaches so powerfully in front of the Jews when they brought him in and questioned him that they scream and plug their ears like middle schoolers and rush at him and murder him. These are not the same people they were in chapter 27 as they are in chapter 28. This is an awesome transformation. And this is the transforming power that Jesus can have in the life of all, all believers. And they were acutely aware of their weakness and sinfulness and undeservingness. The crucifixion story had made that clear. And I think that's why they reacted the way they did. I think the disciples and I think the women saw when Christ raised from the dead. It must have just echoed in their head. Why didn't we anticipate this? Jesus said over and over again, I'm going to die and raise in three days. The women weren't going to the tomb expecting to see a risen Lord. The disciples weren't hiding in a locked room expecting to see the risen Lord. They were just lost. What happened? Yet Jesus had said over and over, destroy this temple, I'll build it again in three days. I must die three days later, I will raise from the dead. And as soon as they saw him, it must have just burst through their eardrums or through their mind. Of course, of course he's alive. Whoa, you know. But I think, I think that part of the reason the disciples had to experience their humiliation is that we have to be willing to fall down on our face and just grab at the feet of Jesus. We have to be willing to get low because the reality is you are low. You just have to admit that you're low. But we spend most of our lives trying to prove that we're high, right? Don't take that in the wrong context. We're trying to spend most of our lives trying to prove that we are lofty and, and you know, important. I'm going to lose it here. All right. 
The stunning mercy and grace of God, the love of God towards totally undeserving sinners compels them to surrender their possessions and their desires and their hopes and so on and rather radically commit themselves to his purpose and his cause. And so here's a few questions uh, that I want to ask you, one attached to each of these uh, groups of people. Will you, like the women, cling to the feet of Jesus? This is all in reaction to the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. Will you cling to Jesus, treasuring him with fear and joy and eagerness? Or will you be like the guards who witnessed the moment for which they were created and who have every opportunity to see the risen Lord, but will you be tempted away by the possessions and pleasures of this world? Will you be like the leaders and let the darkness of your heart blind you from Jesus and cause you to search for him or search for ways to be done with him, looking for every reason not to believe in the resurrection of Christ? Or will you be like the disciples, and you can be like the women and the disciples here, who are totally transformed by him and who obey even to the point of death, who don't pray for the easing of circumstances, but pray for the ability to endure in the midst of whatever God brings in their life. I'm stunned by this verse in Romans, and it's a familiar one. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless and weak, totally unable to make ourselves important or lifted up. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. And so here's my last thing I want to just challenge you with. Are you acutely aware of your desperate need for Jesus, day by day, minute by minute? Have you found the meaning of all existence by accepting the glorious grace and mercy of God and experience his love through Jesus' death and resurrection for you? Have you believed in him and trusted him? Have you laid yourself down and taken him up? And are you actively pursuing the purpose of your life by doing the Great Commission and making disciples? If you have to answer no to any of the three of those, please, I invite you, talk to me, talk to one of our elders, deacons, or just find somebody that you respect in this congregation who's sitting in this room and pour your heart out to them. Admit to them, man, I, I don't know how low I am. I haven't accepted Jesus as my Savior, or I'm not trying to make disciples. What do I do? And we invite you to take care of that today. Because the death and resurrection of Jesus is what it, whatever it is, it is all about Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for um, this glorious truth and grace that you've uh, given to us in your word. God, if it weren't for your words, you know, if it's not for your word, we aren't here today. We don't know about the glorious grace that you have but we get to stand here and worship you. And God, let us in this moment worship you, both through song and through attitude and through action, through the way we eat our lunch, the way we do Sunday school, the way we interact with our neighbors today. May everything be worshiped to you because truly and only do we find our value in you, Jesus. Help us in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we sing in response?